हेलो सर हेलो यू हैव एन कनेक्टेड टू द ऑडियो सर सर यू हैव नॉट कनेक्टेड टू द ऑडियो
Hello, good evening. Hello. Hello, Ankita, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Yes, uh, so you have to hand over the uh, session to um, Neha, ma'am. Okay, she's joining right now. Okay. Okay, so you okay. have to uh, first give the, the introduction and then hand over the session to her. She will continue, right? Okay, okay, sure. Okay, thank you, thank you. Good evening, all. So for today's session, uh, hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so for today's session, uh, we will start with uh, the sound level first and uh, we will go to the, uh, no, no, uh, no, we, we are starting with that uh, screen time first and then we will go to the sound levels in uh, NICU, okay? So, uh, we will start as soon as uh, Preeti ma'am joins. Okay. And uh, Urmi and uh, uh, you you people know now how to uh, share the screen okay. and uh, run. Yes, ma'am. Okay. The Come. Kamlish, you have the, uh, you're prepared with screen sharing, yeah? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mostly today, Baldev sir will join for a few uh, time only. So, and for the next uh, second session, Ashish Mehta sir and Somshikar sir both will be there. Okay, ma'am. Kamlesh, can you rename yourself? Your name is coming as Samsung. Hmm. And Ankita is today's host. I am doing the renaming. Please just let me know the spelling and I am uh, doing the renaming. Okay. So please tell your name, sir. Yes, please. Kamlesh. Right, ma'am? Yes, yes. Dr. Kamlesh. Okay, okay. Just a moment, ma'am. Yes, it's done. Okay, Kamlesh, can you stop sharing?
यस प्रीति मैम गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग प्रीति मैम जस्ट मिनट आई जस्ट या या Good evening. Good evening. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you, Nehal. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> so we will be starting at exactly six, uh, and from Clar Clarinet, who is there? I'm here, ma'am. Hi, yes, yes. Ankita. Yes. So I'll be hosting today. So Ankita, after Clarinet's video, you will uh, hand over to. Hand over to you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, we are just one minute here. We will be start starting. Hi, Arti, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, Doctor Preeti. Hello, Arti. How are you? Fine, fine. After a long time. Yes. <laughs> On the screen. <laughs> yeah. For screen time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We are meeting through the screen. Yeah. One, so it's uh, sharp six p.m. So are we good to go now? Yes, yes. You can start. Oh, okay. So good evening and welcome to one and all present in this session. I'm Ankita from Clarinet. Clarinet is very proud to be a part of this webinar as a digital partner. I would like to share a short video of that. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for all of your patience. Clanet is uh, India's largest live digital CME and doctors generated medical content platform. Our website is www.clanet.com, where we have lots of live sessions conducted by eminent speakers across the globe. And we have made wiki services, which is medical Wikipedia for doctors only. That also you can read in a leisure time. We will invite all the doctors to visit our website. Now, without any further delay, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Neha Patil. Ma over to you, ma'am. Thank you all for all. Thank you, Thank you so much, Clanet and providing this platform to connect us all and especially the PGs. Uh, welcome all to the eGurukul Patshala PG Clinic. Uh, for today's uh, uh, session, we have journal club. And in the journal club, we have two topics. One is elevated sound levels in NICU, which will be presented by Dr. Urmi Kalawadia. And another is screen time in children. And another is screen time in children which will be presented by Dr. Kamlesh Bhatia. For this, we have experts. One of the experts, we are very happy to introduce her, Dr. Preeti Galgali. She is Director and Consultant Adolescent Health Specialist at Bengaluru, uh, Bengaluru Adolescent Care and Counseling Center. She is also Secretary of International Chapter Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine in USA. She is chairperson of Adolescent Health Academy. Uh, she was in, uh, in 2019. Very welcome, sir. Uh, very welcome, ma'am. And we are so glad to have you. She is one of the author of today's presentation. And so we will have a very nice discussion on this. For this, we have another expert. Dr. Ashish Mehta, sir, and uh, he is a consultant neonatologist at Arpan Newborn Care Center at Ahmedabad. Uh, he will be joining soon. Now for this session, our two uh, presenters, I welcome both the presenter, Dr. Urmi Kalawadia and Dr. Kamlesh Bhatia. They are the second year residents at Department of Pediatrics in NHL Medical College and SVP Hospital. I also welcome their mentor, Dr. Shachi Ganatra. She is an assistant professor in the department and she has pre she is, uh, her area of interest is newborn, KMC and the developmental pediatrics. She prepared both the students to have this general club discussion and so we are glad to have you, ma'am. 
I also uh, welcome my uh, Vice President West Zoom, Dr. Yogesh sir, and he is the one key uh, key person for this uh, program. So welcome, sir. Thank you, madam. Continue. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I just joined. Dr. Somshekar will join at 6.30. Okay, sir. And uh, I also welcome Dr. Arti Kinikar, uh, ma'am. She is a constant support for this e-gurukul session. So, welcome, ma'am. So, we can start now with the first presentation uh, on this uh, screen time. So, you can start, Dr. Kamlesh. Uh, for today's session, ma'am, uh, they will be presenting. And uh, if anything you want to discuss in between, you can stop them and can discuss at that time also, or they can complete the presentation and then we can discuss on the topic, on both the way, whatever is uh, convenient for you, ma'am. Yes. Good evening, all the faculties. Uh, today's uh, general club is about the screen time and digital wellness in infant, children, and adolescent. Uh, this guideline is proposed by the IAP in December 2021. Uh, 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 also, I'm thankful to the, my mentor, Dr. Sachi Ganatra, uh, and also thankful to the, my HOD and all, this, uh, all the faculty of NHL Medical uh, College. Uh, I also acknowledge uh, the, uh, all the authors of this guideline, uh, which is very important nowadays. Uh, now, the basic introduction is screen time and digital technology have become an inevitable part of childhood mm -hmm. with shift of learning and socialization to virtual environment. However, the concern on ill effect of excessive exposure to the screen and digital media have emerged. WHO and several other professional organizations have issued a recommendation on digital wellness and screen time for children, infant, and adolescent. Now, this, uh, this uh, guideline is... Uh, uh, how it formed, it formed uh, by the, uh, an expert committee constituted by the IAP, consisting of various uh, stakeholders pri in private and public sector. A detailed review uh, document was circulated in uh, uh, all the member and the national cons uh, consultative meet was held in 26 March, 2021, and they have uh, formulated this guideline. Now, they, uh, uh, now there are nine subcommittees were formed uh, to analyze this guideline and uh, about the nine topics like definition and type of digital media, extent of problem, importance of digital media, harmful effect of screen time, uh, the effect of screen time on health, development and psychology, uh, child safety and security, family and societal perception, existing guideline and legislation related to use of digital media and screen time. Now the problem is screen exposure is uh, reported as early as infancy in almost all the countries. Among under five children, access screen time prevalence varies from 10% to 93.7% across Kamli, high income. Kamli, sorry, sorry to interrupt yes. you. Have you started yes. screen share? Yes. No, it's your screen is not visible. Screen sharing uh, is not coming. Yes. Screen share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, now it is. Oh. Yes. Uh, the extent of problem due to this screen time is screen exposure is reported as early as infancy in almost all the countries. Among under five children, excess screen time prevalence varies from 10% to 93.7% across high income countries and 21 to 98% in middle income countries. Overall screen time guideline is 0.9 to 3.5 hours per day among under five children, one to 3.1 hours per day in school aged children, 1.3 to 7.1 hours per day in adolescent. Now in Western countries, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics uh, study shows that the school aged school aged children and adolescents reported average daily TV time hour two hour per day in children about above eight or eight years of age. Approximately three fourths of teenager owned a smartphone and a smartphone and twenty five percent of teenager were found to be constantly connected to the internet. Social media sites, mainly Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, were being used by 75% of teenagers. Approximately 80% household owned a device 
used to play video games, uh, boys being the most avid video games player. In India, it demonstrates similar trends as Western world with initial exposure to screen-based media as early as two months of age, median age of first exposure to screen at 10 months. Most children are exposed to screen-based media by 18 months of age with greater uses of smartphone, which is 96%, uh, than television, uh, which is 89%. In another Indian study, which is uh, proposed in 2019, four out of five preschool children reported using smartphone device, uh, primarily for grams and videos. In study among Indian adolescents, three four, 76.4% of them viewed television during meal time and only 22.9% had family, family rules for watching television. Now, one study uh, in Canada, uh, which is proposed by the BMC Public Health Study, uh, according to this study, uh, the uh, this study is assessed with the childhood experience questionnaire. Uh, according to this study, developmental vul uh, vulnerability, uh, vulnerability versus developmental health in five domains like physical, social, emotional, language, and cognition, and also communication skill was measured with the early development instrument so that the children with more than one hour of daily screen time were more likely to be vulnerable in all five developmental health domains. Daily screen time did exceed the uh, recommended one hour limit for young children as suggested by the Canadian 24 hour movement guidelines for children and youth is negatively associated with developmental health outcomes in earlier childhood. Now, which are the factors uh, <clears throat> which are the factors uh, affecting screen time. Uh, children, uh, in children, age of the introduction of screen device, duration of the sleep, sedentary preference, eating in front of the skin, in parents and caregiver, parental screen time and perception, working hours and education. Now, demographic uh, uh, factors, easier access to digital media, high background television time, number of screen device at home, uh, socioeconomical status and working of parent from home. Now, which are the harmful effect of screen time? <clears throat> First is the obesity. Pro uh, uh, food advertisement import a link between the unhealthy food consumption, decrease physical activity, increase intake of high calorie food, and decrease sleep. <clears throat> now, sleep, second is the sleep disturbance due to the screen time. Blue light emitted by electronic media uh, suppress and dis uh, disturb the melatonin secretion. This uh, also affects sleep disturbance. Like uh, also the violent and sexual con uh, content portrayed in media can cause excitement, fear, and stress, leading to delayed onset of sleep. Violent daytime media exposed has been associated with nightmare and night awakening. Uh, now, uh, other, another uh, effect is postural effect and visual disturbance. Uh, increased trace around the cervical spine with early wear and tear and degeneration during the during using the screen uh, in uh, most of the hours. Uh, refractive error, astigmatic, astigmatism, and ocular discomfort also there. And headache is also due to the visual disturbance. <coughs> uh, another effect is on cognitive development. Impair parent-child interaction and disrupt sustained toy play. Higher risk of uh, delayed language development, learning problem, and reading problem. Exposure to violent content can influence antisocial and aggressive behavior. Adolescents who are exposed to violent video games reported increased hostility, physical fight, and proper school performance. Now, body image and perception and emotional disorder. Negative social comparison can lead to worsening of body image perception and harmful psychological impact on the, uh, on the uh, person. Uh, early exposure to television at age of one and three years has been associated with attention problem at seven years of age. Uh, study also demonstrates some extent of association between social media use and depressive symptom. Now, drug and substance abuse also uh, uh, increased due to this uh, screen time and also this all uh, social media. A large proportion of screen time in preschool children was explained by interpersonal, intrapersonal, and physical environment factor within home setting. Parental cognitive factor at interpersonal level were of particular relevance. Uh, this study suggested that 
future intervention aiming to foster appropriate screen time habit in preschool children may be most effective if they target parents for behavior changes now this banish there are also some beneficial effect of screen media uh, learning and social interaction for children about 2 year of age shared use of media between children and parent may help enhance learning interaction it can promote healthy behavior and counter undesired effect among children and adolescent social marketing campaign are effective means to promote behavior changes like prevention and control of substance abuse encouraging physical activity maintaining healthy diet and prevention of sexually transmitted diseases Uh, according to systemic review tailored audio or text message on cell phone can enable adolescent improve their health related knowledge increase compliance to medication and this is monitoring setting reminder for regular appointments now which are the effective intervention most of the intervention were based on the behavior change theory the most effective intervention include those which specifically targeted and set goals for reduce tv viewing or screen media use use electronic uh, use electronic uh, electronic monitoring device uh, contingent feedback system or clinical based counseling had high le- uh, had also high level of uh, parental involvement or recruit par- participant who were already overweight or obese at baseline had restricted access to the television or computer or by providing opportunity for physical activity uh, the tv turn off peak strategy was documented beneficial to reduce screen time now guidelines in indian scenario indian psychiatry association recommendation in 2020 and 2020 uh, 2021 uh, children less than 2 year uh, there should not be any screen time Uh, between 2 to 5 year for specific purpose like educational games or teaching aid not longer than 30 minute per session maximum two session per day under supervision uh, according to iap recommendation for children and families family uh, infant and children aged uh, 0 to 23 month of age should not be exposed to screen for any reason minimal or occasional screen time allow for social interaction with close family members staying at distant uh places screen media like smartphone tablet television should not be used to facilitate feeding screen media should not be considered as an easy option to calm a crying distressed child family should avoid incidental exposure uh parents should look out for and prevent screen exposure in their absence when the child is being looked after by a domestic help or in uh, crutches or day care center uh parents should involve child in physical play activity storytelling music and movement and age appropriate toys for promote early childhood development now children aged uh, 24 month to 5 year uh, screen time of maximum 1 hour per day with each session not more than 20 to 30 minute always under supervision do not start a habit of media multitasking it should not be used during meal within 1 hour before sleep or during surface travel at least at least 3 hours of physical activity of any intensity and 10 to 14 hours of good quality sleep daily screen time needs to be always supervised by the caregiver promote safe use of screen media between child and family to ensure interaction and quality exposure caregivers should ensure that the content being watched is educational age appropriate non violent healthy and preferably interactive now guideline for children aged 5 to 10 year screen time less than 2 hour per day it should not be used to overcome boredom uh, parents should monitor when children are using screen for education so that children are not swaying away from lesson to play game or view online content or communicate with other online encourage and reward appropriate use of screens at least they should have 9 to 12 hour of sleep at least 1 hour per day of physical activity of moderate to vigorous activity now screen time must not be replaced study time play time sleep time family time uh, and me time child should not get an independent phone tablet or laptop modify the home environment by restricting access to the digital media uh, screen media exposure should be main, uh, mainly for the purpose of education learning and social interaction uh, recreational screen time should be kept to minimal now guideline for the adolescent 
10 to 18 years. Balance, balance screen time and activity required for overall development. At least one hour of outdoor physical activity, eight to nine hours of nighttime sleep and time for schoolwork, hobbies, peer interaction and family. Monitor media used by adolescent and ensure that they are not exposed to any, uh, to any violent or undesirable content. Discuss the content with them and use the opportunity to instill media literacy, value, healthy and safe lifestyle and knowledge of cyber laws and strategy to detect fake news and messages. Ensure that screen use is not uh, interfering with their academic performance, mental health and talent development. Parents should act as a role, mo role model to promote digital wellness in uh, childhood age. Educate adolescents about safe and healthy use of screen device. Most of the screen times should be related to education, communication, skill development, and promoting healthy lifestyle, and also safety. Uh, parents should update themselves, uh, themselves regarding new technologies so that they could effectively monitor the media use by adolescents and can detect any uh, inappropriate activity. They should have password and ability to access all the online content at any time to protect and reach youngsters about their digital footprint. Now, a guideline for healthy use of media. Uh, ensure a warm, nurturing, and sub, uh, supportive and fun feel environment at home. Uh, screens should be switched off one hour before bedtime and multitasking should be avoided. Adopt the correct posture while sitting in front of the computer and mobile phone. To reduce eye strain and dryness of the eye, it is important to follow 20-20-20 rule. Uh, uh, it states uh, like a cease, uh, cease screen for 20 minutes, take a break for 20 seconds and look at an object 20 feet away. Avoid program and games with violent content. Use teachable moment on the media to convey family value, healthy lifestyle, and interpret media messages. Mark digital free zones like bedroom, dining table, kitchen, bathroom, and uh, motorized vehicle where no family member use a gadget. Uh, that time of the family bonding, uh, the schedule for such digital fasting. Uh, that means short daily break uh, or and longer weekend breaks can be decided through mutual convenience of family members. Uh, mark digital free zone and decide upon a digital fasting time when no family member use any uh, devices. Now uh, the guide, uh, they also propose a guideline for the school uh, ensure that the screen based device, smartphone or LED screen are not the only tools used for, for teaching learning activity. Use a mix of conventional instructional media. Ensure that online educational content only supplement and does not replace the routine teaching, learning, and physical activity like chalk and board uh, in the school, except during the disaster calamities when school attendance is not possible. Uh, in case of online education, is the only option. School shows the uh, uh, Pragyata guideline. This Pragyata guideline mainly comes in a uh, uh, picture in COVID-19. Uh, period. According to uh, this Pragyata stays for uh, plan, review, arrange, guide, talk, assign, track, and appreciate the activity of the students. Uh, uh, there is also uh, some other uh, activities like minimize assignment, homework, and evaluation that needs use of screen, uh, especially for children up to 10 years of age, avoid screen whenever possible. Educate parents about digital wellness and cyber safety during interaction with parents. Do not allow children to bring digital device to school and do not allow school activity to be posted on mass social media like making pages or for picnics or other school activity. Teachers should not be allowed to use phone during the class and should not be uh, expected to read, uh, read or respond to email during school hours. Now, this is a guideline for the pediatrician. Uh, screen, uh, screen media should not be used to distract child to facilitate examination and procedure. Ask or observe parents and adolescents about their screen time and impart uh, anticipatory guidance to follow age-appropriate digital well-being. Provide written or printed uh, material to family about digital well-being. Encourage non-judgmental communication with parents children and adolescent involve both parent uh, both parent during the counseling session 
all children children filling uh, maximum permitted limits of uh, viewing screens should be followed up subsequently during next visit uh, children above the age of 5 year and adolescents should be interviewed in private and with confident uh, uh, private and with confidentiality regarding detail of screen usage duration frequency and content of program view and it is and its effect on their activity of daily living and development uh, this should be screened for cyber bullying online sexual harassment and media addiction this should be motivated to follow healthy media usage uh, educate other community member about impact of screen media on child health and development and promote digital wellness and role modeling in society thank you ma'am very well presented dr kamlesh yes ma'am thank you ma'am so to start the discussion i uh, start with the uh, one of the thing that whenever you are sitting as a pediatrician in a your consult uh, yes. chamber and if a parent come then how will you ask for the screen time and so that you know exactly what is the screen time of the child um ma'am i will ask about means uh, how much time in the day time or night time uh, he or she used the mobile or any other devices or television in at home uh, uh, her his or her school time or in play time or uh, every history i will ask about priti ma'am your comment <laughs> so it's a very tricky question you know previously we just had um, a desktop right and it was easy to monitor but now with children having mobile phones and they may not may or may not tell you the exact screen time i'm talking about the older children mm. Mm. the the smaller children it is relatively easy in the sense if parents tell us how much time they spend on the screen right so up to 5 years definitely we can ask the parents and i would put it the other way how much time do you spend playing with your children or how much is the screen free time you know maybe we could kind of you know the last word on the screen history or the media history is still not said we ourselves are learning a lot as we are going along so for the younger children definitely take the parents on board ask them how do they spend their day i think this is a very non judgmental and a very nice question to ask parent what do you do during the weekdays how, how do you spend mm. your day during the weekends what makes your child happy if your child was crying how do you distract your child you know and when you are giving vaccination in the clinic see what they do do they talk to the child or immediately they take out the phone and say beta isko dekho isko dekho ye rhyme dekho mm. then you know how much is the screen time <laughs> Right? Or if the child is asking for the phone while you're talking to the parents, so these are some of the indications like how you would be taking. As far as the older adolescents go, so we can say children above the age of eight years can very well give a good history. So I would suggest definitely take them in private. Ask them what do you like doing in your time after school. okay so again ask them a general question how do they spend their time the second thing which you can ask them is what are your favorite programs so everybody will be keen to discuss their favorite programs rather than saying oh you spend so much time and you shouldn't be spending right so, and as you said correctly i would like to know how much time are they sleeping and how much time are they playing how much time are they studying so these are excellent questions to ask to, to assess the effect of screen time on their daily activities now another thing which has come up lately is the social media usage right so we as pediatrician should learn how to ask for this which are the apps or the websites that you routinely like to go okay that is one question how much time do you spend on these websites do you ever feel that you have to reduce your time ask the adolescent himself or herself to introspect have you ever tried to reduce time on these websites or on the social media sites 
then how do you feel after using the social media side? Like they say, I go to Instagram and I feel terrible about myself. I hate myself. So what is happening there? Why do they hate themselves? What are the kind of messages that they are viewing? Right? So you get a lot if you ask this one question, how do you feel after using the media? Right? Another question you can specifically ask is, have you been cyberbullied? Have anybody, you know, given online sexual solicitation messages? Has anybody texted you? Okay. So these are the, some of the histories. So we are not only talking about the screen time. We are also concerned about what are they doing on the screens? Because as you know, during the COVID, we have understood that we cannot do without the screens. The screens have been a big source of learning and socialization. Right. What we need to ensure is digital wellness. So we are ensuring physical, mental, emotional, psychological health and safety and security. And we have to think of ways how to quickly screen for these. These are the, some of the questions which you may be asking the adolescent. Time of parents is extremely, extremely important. Yes, so that is what I actually wanted to uh, come into the discussion. That if, uh, Kamlesh, you are asking a parent directly that how much screen time the child is having, they will never tell you. Yes, so <laughs> what is that is the indirect questions. Indirect what Preeti I'm suggesting. That yes. how is the activity and what. Then you can go in the detail that which activity is on what time. Yes. So that was what I wanted to bring out from you and the ma'am's uh, uh, superb interaction and suggestions. Uh, ma'am, anything else you want to uh, start, Kamlesh, to explain, and then we can add on. So, Kamlesh, I wonder if you have seen about the effect of COVID on uh, media use. Yes, ma'am. Uh, adolescents and children. Did you try to explore that aspect? Uh, during the COVID-19 period, uh, the, all the schools and uh, jobs and all the companies were shut, uh, shut off. Uh, during that period, the public uh, will started uh, uh, more the more use of the social media and all. Also, watching the entertainment like movies and all uh, in this uh, in these uh, uh, different apps. Uh, this uh, this makes and uh, the excessive and uh, more effect on the health of the. Uh, health of the uh, most of the persons uh, uh, during the COVID periods. Right. So, so that's absolutely fine. But you know, I always like to talk about positives of the media first. You know, so you definitely, as I said before, COVID nineteen was a time when education could somewhat continue. We are not very sure about the quality of education that we gave, and we know that many children, especially the younger younger children, have fallen off the learning curve. Right. Yes. But some kind of education could still be uh, continued. It also made us obvious about the digital divide, which is existing in our country and how we need to really improve on that. If for God forbid another pandemic strikes, we should be ready. You know, yes. so, we, so how our online education system has to increase in that. And I think this is a topic for research. And we want see, as you can see from the guidelines, we had very little data from India. So we would want young people like you to go and conduct more research on media and its effects. And if possible, do a longitudinal study. What we are doing is a cross-sectional study cross where we are seeing only associations. We cannot say causations, you know? So really we don't know what is happening. And if you know, there is a which is going on in US, it is called the ABCD study. It is adolescent brain cognitive development where they're seeing really the following children from nine years onwards into young adulthood. And they're measuring what are the changes which are taking place due to media ex exposure. So a lot of papers are coming out as they are doing the study, but I think we will get a whole lot of information from that kind of a study. Uh, and they have seen that the social media usage, in fact, increased by 25 to 30 percent amongst adolescents. And can you believe in this COVID period, 50 percent of the adolescents were going on to the media for seeking information regarding health and nutrition? OK, so so they were not relying on the official websites like 
the Ministry of um, Health and Family Welfare sub, uh, website, they were relying more on the peer influencers. So we should also be, you know, very aware of this term of peer influencers. Good, who speaks well and who can get a lot of likes and has no scientific information at all. So you should be kind of aware about, you know, also ask which are the celebrities you like to follow on the media? This is also a good question to ask. And where do you seek your health and nutrition, you know, information for, yes. right? So that is why there has been an increase in the body image concerns, increase in COVID basicity, we have said, corona anxiety, corona somnia, all related to the media. Again, I will say association. Let us not do media mm -hmm. bashing. In fact, let us teach the adolescent how to use the media in a more healthy and safe manner. Right? Yes. So, Kamlesh, you uh, started with the age of zero to ahead, then zero to two yes, to two five. Uh, zero yes. So, what do you uh, comment on a uh, exposure of screen time, even at the when the fetal life is there? So, any comments on that? Uh, mm -hmm. Difficult and twisted. Yes, <laughs> That's yeah, an excellent uh, question, Neha, actually. So research is actually um, going on into the in utero effects in and the effect of media use by the pregnant women. So they say if you have a mobile phone and you keep it on your abdomen, so that's very close to the uterus, the waves, radio waves do penetrate into the uterus and they affect the impulse control of the fetus in utero. So the last word has still not been said, but the research is on. And it is probably best to avoid media usage as much as possible during the pregnant period, and especially trying to keep it on your uterus. Please don't do that. If at all you do, you keep it here, right? So that they, there are some simple guidelines to follow. And of course, media can make you very unhappy with yourself. So if it makes you unhappy, don't use it to the pregnant mother. Keep happy by probably praying going out for walks. Huh? So that would be a good way to keep yourself happy rather than relying on the media, which makes you unhappy. So the direct effect, and there will be an indirect effect of media use also in this period. So again, a topic of research and a very, very important topic, I feel in the current era. Because in uh, many of our tales, the old tales, they are like that of the Abhimanyu who learned so many things mm -hmm during the pregnancy itself. So that was what the uh, thing that, how this media effect will, will be there or the screen effect will be there on the fetus. So ma'am uh, said very rightly. It was in my mind when uh, I have seen many of the uh, IT workers, they were doing all the things uh, by being at home only. So, uh, everything and at that time many of the people were pregnant also and as ma'am said they were keeping the laptop on the uterus and they are doing all the work whole of the day they are using their bump as a table and you uh, doing the work so i don't know how many uh, fetus have been exposed to that and the adverse effect of it so that is uh, what i wanted to highlight so from my side, one more thing. So between a zero to two years, at what age the child starts attracted to the screen? At that is the age where parents need counseling. So Kamlesh comments on that. Mostly after the six month, ma'am, uh, a, a child misattuned uh, by the parents. Uh, uh, when uh, he or she uh, can understand uh, what is the means uh, musical things. And started addicting on that. Okay, so you want to say that the musical things, that is what the child gets yes, attracted. And they start watching the screen from that time. Yes. 
तो चाइल्ड इज अट्रैक्टेड टू म्यूजिक इवन विद दी दैट घुघरा टाइप ऑफ थिंग राइट यस मैम तो एग्जैक्टली इज इट द म्यूजिक व्हिच अट्रैक्ट्स द चाइल्ड और द पिक्चर्स दैट इज द कलर्स व्हिच अट्रैक्ट द चाइल्ड कलर्स मोस्टली द कलर्स मैम चेंजिंग कलर्स ऑफ द तो दैट इज वेपर ऑब्जेक्ट्स या ओके सो मैम योर कमिंग्स so i am very glad kamlesh mentioned music because in fact music and indian classical music has been shown in some studies to have a very good effect on brain development yeah. right so this is one of the positive effects of media so if at all you want your child to hear keep the phone away put probably keep it in the other room even yeah so that the child does not get exposed to those radio frequency waves one more thing apart from you know the the lights and the and changing uh, changing screens which can affect the developing brain it is also keeping a phone close to the thin skull it allows the radio frequency waves to enter the skull again the last word on malignancy and use of mobile phones in thin skulls especially less than 16 years and in pregnant women it's still not out but this is a thing to be careful about right and this change they they get very attracted to and the parents feel oh my child is, is smiling you know and they feel very proud of it they are not realizing that the child is smiling with all those color changes but you are actually setting in the child getting more and more kind of addicted i'll put it in quotes because still i would say media addiction is still not in our dsm 5 type as a mental disorder but definitely it is not the age even a newborn can see the changing lights and the changing colors so when we give vaccination they come to you for 6 weeks ask them how do they play with the child that is a good question to say and if they say screen say no no it is known to cause attention deficit hyperactivity disorder so if you have less time even i think is in i think these are the things which you need to emphasize because my most of the parents have forgotten how to really play with the child yes uh, so that is the early age when the child starts looking start starts interacting like that the social smile comes at that time only the parents introduces the screen to the child and then they uh, they are initially happy being that that the child is enjoying it and after that mm-hmm. it is uh, the child who gets addicted to the screen so any uh, com- anything that like any milestones which are affected because of the excessive screen usage so kamlesh your comment on this uh, cognitive means mm-hmm. more more like physical that is there all uh, there to uh, give all the answers and guide us through the journal these are some questions which are there in my mind so that's why i am keeping the ball rolling uh, after that it's your turn you can ask anything to ma'am <laughs> uh, <clears throat> mostly the physical activity is reduced due to the screen time uh, in childhood or infancy age also. so motor milestones you are telling yes, that they motor. will be developed late okay yes. any other thing like motor milestones you say because they are physically uh, not interacting or they are uh, having a sedentary lifestyle that's why motor yes, milestones sir. are affected what about fine yes. motor fine motor are also mem can affect can you give any example child is uh, means avoiding playing with the other child and all uh, so the uh, the fine words like uh, uh, so many fine words can affected by it. Okay. so what i observe is when the child they are given uh, given the ipad or the uh, screens they are used to do it like scroll okay the finger they are using and they are u- using it very swiftly and they are scrolling it but with that they forgot to play with the other children making some fine movements of the fingers 
so the pincer grasp is affected most and that is why the scribbling and the all these things they come very very late ma'am your comment yeah so i think all milestones get affected but the milestone which gets affected the most is language you know language and speech delays that is what is very very they'll come to you and the parents will say he's not speaking and then you say just stop the media for some time start interacting and you know i worked in nimhans for a month or so the most common complaint they were referred as autism and what in nimhans used to be you know coming from orissa west bengal they used to admit the parent and the child and stop all digital devices and believe it or not within a week if it was not truly autism the child used to start speaking so this is one milestone and in fact there is come a kind of in quotes digital autism it's not really autism it's because of excess exposure to screens having said that we must, i must also say that autism in cases of autism in fact screen has helped the child in actually communication so there are two angles to the same thing you know we may we may curse it for that particular condition but we also know if used appropriately in moderation it may help the child to communicate with others so that has also been studied right yes so any other questions from urmi kamlesh dr sachi even dr yes, uh, ma'am i have one question that i have routinely some patients or uh, parents coming that uh, at some some of the child is so much into the screen media that the parents complaining that they are not listening like 2 3 4 hours per day and they are helpless okay, how to reduce the screen time they are just not listening they are doing everything ready to play interact but when they say that after one hour or two or please shut down they start screaming and everything and they have to extend some of the time now so how to gradually decrease the screen time or how can we counsel or what how can we tell the parents what are the effective intervention that we can reduce the screen time in these children that are difficult to <laughs> deal with so uh, uh, like sachi you know about obesity the best is prevention right <laughs> yes so, so you know having these guidelines discussing with the uh, parents before they give a screen to the child what are the rules making mm-hmm. rules for screen mm-hmm. time you know right in the beginning and how to ensure that they have enough space sleep they have enough physical activity they have enough time for pursuing their hobbies family interaction if you have rules in the beginning then probably you will not have so many problems later on usually uh, media is given as a gift so when you give a gift to a child you actually have no control over it the child can use as he as he or she wants so so i would say refrain from giving them as gifts give them when they really need it for what particular purpose are you giving and the rule should be clearly defined the second point is yes you are very right this has become very very common the ch- the parents try to take away the media the child gets anger aggression mm. violence issues right now these are the children who need very careful evaluation what is it why is it they going to the media what is happening in their psychosocial history right so we have an acronym which we use in adolescent medicine which goes by the um, heads is what it goes by so we take a history regarding home education eating activities drugs sexuality suicide safety so what is the mood of the child is this child in depression is this child having an anxiety disorder is this child sexually abused is this child bullied he is looking for pleasure and happiness just mm-hmm. in the media is does he belong to a family which is broken or which is there a lot of marital conflicts is there sibling rivalry so we have to be very careful then just getting frustrated to understand the child what exactly why is he going is it just a presentation of ad presentation of odd is it a presentation of conduct disorder 
So mm. these are some of the things which we go into mind and to, you know, there are many, you have this Young's internet criteria and you have questionnaires to really detect internet addiction in clinical practice. But I'll tell you simple four things, you know, suppose you can get a history from the adolescent that I am using, I can, I have lost control over the use of media. I'm using it compulsively. I'm mm. craving for it. I'm continuing to use the media though I know that I have, have have a fall in performance. My peer relationships have deteriorated. My family relationships have deteriorated. So craving, compulsion, constant use and consequences, right? So these are the four C's. These are very similar to the C's for drug addiction. But remember how the media works on the brain is by stimulating the reward center. How the drug works on the brain is on working on the dopamine reuptake receptors. So here it is not a chemical which is working. It's more like a binge eating disorder. If I have to correlate it, it's more like you eat too much. You know, it's like binge eating. So it is like media binging. Right. So when you move, put it into an addiction mode, no, people say, Are, iska kuch nahi ho sakta. But let us take it as a problematic media use. So that will be a better term to use mm. and how to help the child. So after you have dealt with the psychosocial stressors in the child's life, then there are two ways of doing it. You have to use the technique of motivational interviewing. That is what we call. We tell the child, what are your life goals and what are the ways you have to achieve your life goals? What are the roadblocks? And the child himself or herself should say, yes, media is the problem here. So what do you want mm. to do? Okay, doctor, I'll reduce it by 10 minutes. Good enough. Be happy mm. with that. 10 minutes, come back to me again. And then gradually, we call it, the, call it that's the cold turkey method in drug use. So some of the same principles we follow here. So either some of them will say, I want to give it up totally. Mm. I don't mm. want it at all. Some of them will say, I will use it. I'll decrease the use slowly. So we give the choice to them. As long as we give the choice to them, there is a good collaboration between. But if you're not successful, even after four weeks of counseling, there is probably a mental disorder. And you need to refer this child to a mental health profession. Okay, thank you very much. Just one, Dr. Nehal. Yes. Just adding a little bit because we have two postgraduates over here doing the presentation. Uh, screen time has to be included in your history taking. Mm -hmm. Make it a part of your history taking like anthropometry. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we forget is we always put the blame on that child and the family. So take a family history, how much each one member of the family uh, uses the mobile. In fact, mm -hmm. certain families, they have bought a mobile separate for the child, which should not be done. And uh, if you see many children with temper tantrums, when you start evaluating them, you will realize that tantrum, this uh, temper tantrum is always when the tele mobile is snatched from their hand. So in your OPD, when you get these patients, it should become a part now, unfortunately, of your history taking. Mm -hmm. And in your exam also, if you have a cranky, irritable child, when you are taking the history during an exam, don't give them a mobile. You are also yes. stressed. You want to finish the uh, history taking in 45 minutes. So you give your mobile. And if it is Apple, you had it. You will never mm -hmm. get it back. <laughs> okay, so make sure it is not used as a distraction. And then you look at yourself because we are doing a quality improvement project for undergraduates where we have taken an example of uh, telephone use or screen time among first year MBBS students. And we teach them quality improvement by something called as fishbone analysis read about it because that will help yes. you as medical students also that who what factors are responsible and you can apply that to your patients it includes people processes etc you read it and you'll find solutions because we know it's a problem but we have to give 
solutions. So the solutions are not universal. They are target oriented for that family. You can't generalize. One family may accept your suggestions, but they have to do an analysis what things are wrong in their uh, household. And the very simple thing which we do in our OPD is take away the mobiles of, or at least tell them that all mobiles from your house will be taken away for seven days. Mm -hmm. And then you will find a uh, sort of difference. Because when the mother says, I will not give you mo mobile, the grandfather or the grandmother will eventually give them. Mm -hmm. So the whole family has to be treated for mobile and screen time addiction and not the child or the adolescent. Okay, so for you as uh, postgraduates, uh, uh, if that becomes a part of your history, you will score more marks and you will do very well in your practice. Okay, if you yes, find sir. solutions for that family. Okay, so read a little bit about the quality improvement processes because that will help you get over all your um, medical problems which are behavioral oriented or psychological oriented. It gives you a standardized format like how to approach. Okay? Yes. Or, yes. Very well presented by you, Dr. Kamlesh. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Arti, but you, you know, seven times without this, seven days without the screen. Yeah, it looks like you're putting yourself shop. into a jail right now. So, <laughs> what you so, so things keep changing the time. We yeah. say every day digital free time, but the whole family, it may be even one hour. In fact, I think in Maharashtra, in a village, they you know ring the siren and where everybody puts away their mobile phones for one hour everybody so there's a siren that no it's a mobile free time it's a digital free time and this is the time to family bond so i think every family should decide at least one to two hours every day without the mobile and then they can see the change you can say how did you feel after this that's a very good question to ask i got to know my parents better i didn't know my grandparent would be such a delight to talk with you know you get all these wonderful answers very true So we had a great discussion on screen time. Is there any other things, uh, any postgraduate who is joined wants to ask Dr. Urmi, Kamlesh, uh, Vaishali or Chinmay? Mm, if not, then we can uh, go ahead with the next presentation of sound levels in Neonit. Uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Like Kamlesh. Thank you. Yes, yes Chinmay. Yes, Chinmay. Uh, Thank you very much for the amazing lecture. Uh, I would just like to uh, bring this uh, something uh, just to your notice. Uh, I have noticed that what happens is uh, for, uh, for example, if we are using any anti-virus uh, softwares on our tablets or phone, the premier versions of that, for example, Casper Sky or Mac, if they have uh, what is called the parental control, so uh, for the, for single software being used within a family of four to five members, including teenagers and others, they offer a service uh, wherein parents can remotely uh, monitor uh, what the child, what the teenager is, uh, uh, how much time is being spent online and what particular websites uh, are being visited. And parents could remotely control and even block their websites. Absolutely, Chinmay. So you, you you look into your Microsoft itself. They have a Microsoft family plan they're running. So you can definitely control and see. But you know what happens? Some of these children are very, very smart and they're very good hackers, you know? So they are successful in fooling their parents as well. So for the younger children, it works really well. So nothing works like communication, you know? So I often say, follow BBC, balance, your media time with other activities, have boundaries and keep the communication on. So this is what parents have to follow. Parental controls are excellent for the younger children, but may not work very well for the older ones. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a wonderful discussion. So we are now going ahead with our second presentation. So Dr. Urmi, you can start your presentation. 
Yes. Good evening, all of you. Uh, and thank you all of you for all of them to, for giving me such a nice platform to present my journal club. I'm also very much thankful to my actor, to Dr. Deepa Mankarban and my mentor, Dr. Sachi Ganatra, ma'am. Uh, my presentation. Screen share. Good. Screen share. Good. Try. Unmute Karo. Dr. Rulmi, you are in mute, mute ma'am. Uh, sure. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I have sent you a request to unmute yourself. Please click, click on that, ma'am. Dr. Urmi, ma'am. I'm, I'm calling her. Just a second. Urmi. Urmi, have you started screen share? Screen share, uh, screen, unmute, karo tam, unmute. Uh, yes, Kamlesh, no chalu cha, you can uh, do with that. Good evening, all of you. Sorry for the disturbance.
hello yes yes uh, sorry uh, for the disturbance uh, good evening all of you myself dr urmi kalardia is going to present a journal club on elevated sound levels in nisu guided by dr sachiganathra this article has been issued in advances in neonatal care volume 22 number 6 In past two decades, the survival rate of very low birth weight infants has dramatically been improved. Advancements in NICU now allow survival of infants born as early as 22 weeks of gestational age. However, more of these preterm infants are reaching school age. The incidence of neurodevelopmental problem is becoming more apparent. One of the reasons is excessive noise exposure in NICU. However, the noisy environment. However, the noisy environment in which preterm infants are cared for in NICU may present an overload of sensory stimuli that can negatively affect their physiological responses and lead to behavior changes. Research in the field of neonatal developmentally supportive care highlights that an environment free of excessive noise, decreased neonates, oxygen requirement, ease on respiratory support, and length of hospital stay helps improving developmental outcomes. The sound environment in NICU is louder than most of home or office environments and contains disturbing noise of short duration at irregular intervals. The sound level in NICU ranges from 7 decibel to 120 decibel, often exceeding the maximum acceptable level of 45 decibel recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. The maximum acceptable level of 45 decibel by the American Academy of Pediatrics was based on a report by the Environment Protection Agency. Office of Noise Abatement and Control. Sources of sounds in NICU. The NICU are often characterized by loud, unpredictable noise from external sources such as alarms, ventilators, phones, staff conversation, monitor beeping, sound gener generated by something falling from ground, doctor's conversation, any emergency requiring intubation or resuscitation, syringe from alarming, etc. In addition to self-generated sounds of infants, crying can be a significant source of noise as large sounds tend to be amplified within the incubator. To the above mentioned sound levels, the preterm are extremely susceptible, which affects their growth and various other things. Effects of sound. Effects of sound on infants include increase in heart rate and respiratory rate, blood pressure elevation, apnea, hypoxia, alteration in oxygen saturation. interrupted sleep patterns decrease growth slow weight gain decrease immunity hearing impairment high noise levels are associated with an increased rate of errors and accidents leading to decreased performance among the staff in total <coughs> excessive noise can have negative effects on premature infants growth and sleep patterns and overall development pathophysiology Preterm infants born before 28 weeks of postmenstrual age have an immature auditory system. Myelination of the auditory pathway continues after birth. Microscopic analysis of the cochlea of neonates have shown that hair cells are still in a process of differentiation. By 28 weeks of gestational age, preterm infants' auditory system is sufficiently mature for loud noise to produce physiological changes in heart rate, blood pressure. respiration and oxygenation preterm infants are susceptible to negative effects of environmental stimuli due to central nervous system immaturity and decreased autonomic and self regulatory abilities to deal with stress they are unable to coordinate autonomic responses to environmental and tactile stimulation until 32 to 34 weeks post menstrual age As a result of excessive stimuli, neurons may form alternative pathway between cerebral cortex and brainstem. So, infants at low gestational age have immature central nervous system, putting them at high risk of adverse outcomes due to excessive noise. Therefore, maintaining a stable physiological state is crucial. especially during this critical time for the development of central nervous system when the most rapid neuronal formation is taking place now the methods on the basis of which this article has been proposed is as follows design a descriptive quantitative study was completed using observational and sound level measurements 
research ethics approval was obtained prior to the study initiation. In this study, sound measurements were recorded over 21 different time periods. These 21 different time periods are differentiated into seven days, seven evenings, and seven nights. Seven days time uh, starts from six in the morning till two in the afternoon. Seven evening shift starts from two in the afternoon till 23 hours in the evening. And seven night shift starts from 11 in the night till six in the morning. Box plots were created to show distribution of sound level measurements. During this, all the three shifts will include total 21 different time periods. Now the setting in which this study took place is, this study took place in a level three in ICU in perinatal center in Ontario, Canada, in which the infants are considered the most acutely ill, requiring intensive supportive care that is one is to one. This room is equipped with nine beds and a specialized resuscitation bed. Noise levels were measured in this nine isolate open room, defined as having multiple neonates cared for in a single room, in an open face, without fixed partitions or wall between them. Many of the infants, that is room A, in this anisu are extremely preterm and critically ill, often requiring one instrument staffing. The staffing was equal for all the ships, that is day, evening, and night. Total 13 ships. The room is equipped with a warmer fridge, narcotics cabinet, and computer central monitoring station, and one specialized bed for resuscitation, in addition to the individual equipment necessary for each infant. Sound level data collection. For sound levels, a portable sound meter Kessela model CEL242K was used for data collection. For each time period of the study, the sound meter was positioned in exactly the same location in an unobstructed location. The sound meter was attached to a tripod for a 360 degree sound recording on a portable stand to facilitate ease of movements in the case of an emergency. Sound levels were recorded every second for a total of seven day shifts seven evening shifts and seven nine shifts for analysis. Data from the first two day shifts were subsequently excluded from the analysis due to calibration readjustment. So now out of 21, we now have 19 shifts. The low and high parameters were set at 30 and 100 decibel respectfully. The sound was measured in decibels, which is defined as the pressure of the sound or the intensity of the noise. This measurement uses a logarithmic scale. Therefore, a small increase in decibels represents a large increase in intensity of sound. For example, 10 decibel is 10 times more intense than 1 decibel, while 20 decibel is 100 times more intense than the 1 decibel. Sound data measurements were exported using property software directly into the Microsoft Excel. Observational data collection. Demographic and Observational data were collected simultaneously to identify contributing factors to noise level. Observational data collected included the number of units in the room, number of people in the room, number of alarms, number of IV pump alarming, suctioning event, emergency events, for example, apnea, or bradycardia requiring intervention such as PPV or suctioning, and any other events that contributed to noise level, for example, accidentally dropped objects such as a portable thermometer, a calculator, a capillary blood glucose testing machine. Events were counted and recorded hourly by hand on a data collection sheet designed for this study by the sole researcher. Data analysis, sound level data were analyzed comparing mean differences and the standard deviation of the sound level over different times, shift type, and day of the week. The parametric test analysis of variance, that is ANOVA, was used to compare means across the three types of shift, days and evenings and night. Multiple linear regression analysis was used to determine demographic and observational data associated with the elevated sound level. Now, what are the results of this article or this study? After excluding two shifts, 19 shifts were analysis. So the total number of samples which we have that were 90. So N equals to 90. The stationary sound year two noise meter was activated, illuminated for 90% of the time during the data collection. 
the mean sound levels were recorded as well as the maximum and minimum sound levels were, e were recorded for each of the individual ships. The mean sound level over all the ships was 58.2 decibel for day shift, 53.6 decibel for the evening shift, and 54.5 decibel for the night shift. The maximum sound level for any of the individual ships reached for days, evenings, and night were 83.5 for the day, 83 for the evening, and 80.9 decibel for the night, respectfully. The range of the weekday sound levels varied from 47.1 to 83.5. The weekday sound levels ranged from 47.1 to 81.6 decibel. For all time periods, the maximum and minimum sound levels were above the American recommendation of 45 decibel. This is the sound level measurement in the NISU on different days, that is on day, day shift, evening shift, and the night shift in all the seven days of the week. This figure includes the mean of the sound levels in day, evening, and night shift. And this figure shows the maximum sound level in all the three shifts, that is day, evening, and night. The maximum sound level reached in day shift were 83.5, in evening shift were 83, and during night it was 80.9. Now, observational data. The number of people in the room was continuously fluctuating throughout the each period of time, ranged at any, at any given time from 7 to 34. It was observed that monitor alarms were often not being silenced quickly as they were frequently alarming for greater than three minutes. Examples of recurrent sound recorded were ventilator alarms, which has a 73 decibel of sound, total recorded sound during the alarm. Cardiac monitor alarms have a 60.20 decibel of sound and central monitor alarm, a single computer monitor that visualizes each of the other cardio or respiratory alarm pressing of each individual influence in the unit by 75 decibel of sound. Continuous sounds such as the hum generated from a closed blanket warmer reach 57.3 decibel and sound measurement while the blanket warmer door was being opened and closed on one occasion was recorded as 72.2 decibel. Daily portable x-ray generated sound levels of 66.9 decibel. Sound level generated from the hum of the medulla milk warmer was 66.7 decibel. During each shift, Objects were dropped randomly in the room, for example, a portable thermometer, a capillary blood glucose monitoring machine. This sudden noise created, recorded a sound level of approximately 80.5 decibel. This is the recordment of the sound level in 21 different shifts during the seven days of a week. Discussion. The findings of this study showed that the sound level during each shift in this NISO exceeded the American recommendation 90% of the time. On average, sound levels were 14 times louder than the recommended, roughly the equivalent of a sound of a constantly running vacuum cleaner. As the number of neonates and healthcare providers in the NISO increased, the sound level increased. It was observed that the higher the acuity of the neonate, unit, the more healthcare providers involved and the higher the sound was generated at the bedside. In addition, sound levels have been found to be higher in level 3 NISU than in level 2 NISU, potentially related to increased medical technology utilized in the complex NISU environment. In level 3 NISUs, there are more healthcare provider conversations, life-saving interventions, alarms from cardiopulmonary instability, infusion pumps, and medications requiring a second nurse to verify. Human factors includes the volume and quality of speech, frequency and force of opening and closing doors, and failing to silence alarm quickly. Environmental factors contributing to elevated sound levels in this study include hospital-wide loudspeaker announcement, portable X-ray machines being wheeled into rooms, and recurrent, continuous, and sudden unexpected sounds, such as dropped objects or chair being pulled across the floor. Lack of awareness in healthcare provider, for example, behavior such as using a loud, conventional voice at the bedside, failing to promptly silence the alarms, and loudly opening and closing the doors. 
some healthcare providers may view their work environment as part of the personal space and not that of the sensitive environment of the developing victim unit now what is the strength comprehensive and simultaneous collection of sound and observational data with multivariate analysis limitations of this study was large number of variables were taken into account conclusion this study explored the sound levels in anisu and findings suggestive of sound levels were current by consistently above the 45 decibel multiple factors were identified that contributed to the elevated sound levels in anisu sound levels reduction should be prioritized in anisu to promote developmentally supportive care and optimize the environment using a combination of knowledge translation strategies sustaining a quiet anisu environment depends on engagement of all the healthcare providers and families which will promote premature infants outcome now what are the other related studies apart from this study there are also other studies that have took place for this elevated sound levels in the nisu first study being effects of educational intervention among nisu team and parents in reducing sound levels in neonatal nisu this has been published in j neonatal bio volume 5 This study have shown that hearing capillaries of preterm newborn may get disturbed by raised sound level in an ICU, which usually differs from the intrauterine environment. So, for healthy auditory development, sound levels in an ICU should be similar to intrauterine environment. However, this is not possible in practice, as loud and an undesirable noise from various sources are always present. But Study has documented effectiveness of reducing this level by educating the NICU staff and doctors regarding measures leading to reduce sound levels in NICU. Hence, this should be strictly implemented in NICU to reduce the noise level and for better neonatal outcome. The second study being evaluation of sound pressure levels in pediatric intensive care unit. It was being published in Open Science Journal. The present study points out that in forty. Hours of observation, six thirty nine morning ah uh, monitoring alarms were registered, and four zero five were coming from the ventilator and infusion pump, which states them as one of the main source of alarm. There is a study made in NICU which levels of acoustic events were compared to the acoustic level that exceeded fifty percent of the time. The alarm noises were examined and determined to have peak level that ranges between eighty two to eighty six decibel. In fact, during hours of acoustic recording collected for this study, the noise level was never measured or was below forty-five decibel. After all the recommendation made, it is essential to create strategies within the team to try to reduce noise in ICUs and taking into consideration the routine and the noise level recommendation. Now, the third study was the effects of noise on neonates in an ICU, published in Indian Journal of Applied Research. Now, this study. Uh, showed the effects of noise on neonates in all the uh, four to five parameters, such as effects on cardio cardiovascular system, effects on respiratory rate, effects on the uh, sleep state of an infant. For this study, sixty preterm infants, that is from twenty eight to thirty week, thirty two weeks of gestational age, were randomly assigned to an experimental or control group. The experimental group was then exposed to a recording of their mother's voice, which was playing daily for thirty minutes throughout their hospitalization. At thirty-six weeks, all then were exposed to the ten decibel of noise in drowsy and a thirty seconds recording of a female's voice in an active crying state. It was found that when these infants were exposed to this noise in a drowsy state, it was it was causing acceleration in the heart rate, and while in crying state, it was causing deceleration. However, response to noise not only depends on infant's behavioral stage but also to an prior exposure. Now, summary of the recommendation for practice and research. Now, what we already know: sound levels in NICU existing, which is exist forty five decibel uh, decibel of sound. That is a national recommendation. Excessive noise negatively impacts premature and six neonates in the NICU. Sound levels needs to be lower to promote an optimal environment of growth and neurodevelopment. What needs to be studied was further research focused on effective sustainable intervention to reduce sound levels in the NICU. Research could include an evaluation of the long term effect of noise, education protocols, and the neurodevelopment of preterm infants. Now, apart from this, all things, what can we do today to solve this problem? 
Short term solution includes silencing monitor alarms weekly, using quiet conversation at the bedside during care and during multidisciplinary rounds, scheduling quiet time daily, assignment of noise monitors. Long term solution includes environmental redesign, use of sound absorbing material. Interventions which we can implement in our daily routine practice so that we can reduce the sound level in the NICU includes intervention should begin right from birth at neonatal resuscitation corner till at least 34 weeks of gestational age, but ideally to 36 weeks. The sensory receptor in the minute cochlea occupies an area of cortex comparable to that occupied by an area as large as the skin of the whole face. The cortex in this Area measures about 3 mm in depth is taken. Educate staff and healthcare provider about the hazards of loud noise in NISU and application of knowledge in behavior. Reducing the alarm levels of all the monitors to a safe hearing level. Making habit of promptly attending rather than anticipating monitor alarms. NISU phone ringer was reduced to minimum level which could be well audible none to be given by nursing and orders. Talking in a low volume, just enough to be audible in NICM. Also, the parents of the admitted babies were sensitized regarding sound levels guideline in nursery and explained not to talk or discuss while visiting their baby at the bedside. Posters depicting various sound levels during specific activities in NICM. At time of cleaning, workers were explained to minimize unnecessary sound. Placement of sound ears that displays decibel value, which allow to observe an actual change in the decibel number based upon the behavior, thus providing the positive feedback for effort. Reducing sound level that reaches the individual infant by using EMF or earplugs. Treating infants in a section of NICM, private room concept or incubators, sound reducing incubator corners. Newer design NICUs with individual single patient rooms and sound damping technology. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Urvi. Uh, really nice presentation. Thank and you, uh, uh, today we have Dr. Somshekhar Nimbalkar, sir, joined with us. He's the neonatologist who doesn't need any introduction. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, sir is known to everybody in all over the India, and we are really uh, very much uh, glad to have you, sir, in this uh, platform. We also have Dr. Ashish Mehta, sir, with us. He was the pioneer in starting the neonatology in Ahmedabad, and uh, sir is also a, a sea of knowledge. Both of experts we are having are uh, really gem of the neonatology. So. Welcome both of the experts. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Neil. So as, as you can see, the curtains behind Dr. Ashish Mehta and my room are similar. We are in different rooms of the same hotel at a conference in Jaipur. <laughs> yes, still, but the dedication to neonatology and to teaching is uh, visible with this. <laughs> so to start the ball rolling uh, for this, sound levels in NICU. Uh, she presented a very good uh, uh, thing to start with the discussion. Uh, I would say that in the last of your slide, you recommended ear earplugs or the ear muffs to yes, uh, decrease the sound levels. So yes. any implications of using earplugs on sepsis? So just to start the Bold rolling. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, earplugs in uh, sepsis, or definitely if the hygienic practice hasn't been maintained, then it will lead to sepsis of a new neonatal guy. But if if a proper hygienic practice is to be maintained and then the ear plug or ear muff has been used in the neonatal, then it will definitely decrease the chances of neonatal sepsis. Because apart from ear puff, we are also using so many other instruments or so many other procedures are being done on the neonates, which can also lead to the neonatal sepsis. So I have a question. Uh, it's a good study, uh, well presented. Uh, so I want since it's a done, it's done from uh, Canada. 
So have you uh, come across any studies uh, related to noise from within India or how to improve this noise? Or uh, first question. Uh, actually, sir, some studies are still ongoing uh, in an Indian setup, but uh, still none of the study has been uh, given such a uh, published in our uh, uh, recent uh, journal articles or such that. So I need to take up the study from uh, other settings such as Canada. Okay, uh, so that's one. Uh, there's one study which we did in Karamsat, published in Journal of Neonatology. We did not look at noise. So if you're looking at decibels, then it is true. We did not look at noise, but we looked at how to kind of decrease the uh, alarm noise. So specifically for alarm noise, alarm we did not noise. measure noise. Yeah. So yes. how to reduce the alarm noise uh, in, in, the, in the NICU. Uh, so coming to the question again now, if we, uh, we do know that uh, noise, uh, the article mentions various... Uh, methods of reducing noise uh, yes. would you think uh, that's possible in an indian setting in the setting that you're working in and if it is not possible what would you think of doing uh, yes sir uh, you are definitely right the interventions which i have spoke about it is very difficult to implement in our settings especially in the government hospitals where the rush is so much and also the uh, staff requirement is also there but there is shortage of staff nursing staff as well as the doctors but definitely uh, we can do one thing is that we can educate the people about the uh, elevated sound levels in niso how it affects the new needs how it affects their auditory system and by educating the least we could expect is that none other than thing, but at least they will just silence the alarms which are beeping in the NISU as quickly as possible. The least thing which can uh, which can be done in our setting is educating the people because so many people in our setting does not know what it this the elevated sound levels in NISU what effects it has on the infants or what effects it has on the neonates which are being admitted in the ICU. Thank you. Ashish, by any questions? Yeah, Dr. Purvi. Yes, ma'am. In your day-to-day, -day, in your day-to-day, day-to-day -day rounds or practice, how many times you see that your alarms are adjusted according to desired levels? Not I'm talking. Not I'm talking about the sound meters or the audio meters. I'm talking about ventilator from the from where the alarms are coming. I'm talking about pulse oximeter. I'm talking about multiple monitors. Uh, warmers, infusion pumps, they all have the setting for the alarms. And again, yes. not about increasing volume or decreasing volume, about setting limits. So how many times, I, I, I wish you were truthful that how many times you get opportunity to set the alarms, alarm limits, I mean, or you, 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 you do that. For example, I said the PI for 20 and I see that it goes 20 to 18. That's what I said. Uh, yes. uh, sir, but uh, yeah, you are right. But uh, no, in our settings, the uh, alarm limits have been uh, set uh, in all the monitors, even in the warmer, even in the ventilator, even in the uh, multi-para monitors, the, uh, the limits have already been set. And as soon as the alarm is beeping, if someone is there in the uh, NISO, they are, uh, uh, what we can say, they are quickly silencing the alarm, but yes, during the rounds when all of them are engaged in their work and all of them are occupied with some work post-round changes or in some critical newborn is being admitted or resuscitation has been done, at that point of time, it is being difficult to do such things or to implement such things in our ICU setup. Yeah, that actually, that's the reality that we don't get, that's, that's not a routine practice to see that the alarm limits are set according to the, each patient. There are few machines where the alarms are factory set and you don't have yes. any contribution to that, you know. But yes, for example, pulse proximeter, you will say so many times that without giving oxygen, that baby saturation stays at 95, 96. Yes, sir. Now, the moment you put that pulse oxygen in neonatal mode, automatically adjust alarm at 90 to 95. Baby yes, without sir. oxygen is saturating 96%. Now, that yes, machine is, you will keep on giving alarm. And then the tendency is to decrease the volume or switch it off rather than adjusting the limit through new limit from 94 to 98. Yes, sir. Each monitor has got that, that facility or the or the way to do that. Somehow we don't do that. 
Yes. And then if the warm is alarming, somehow it has been ignored. Like, you know, the bacha garam thai to thai bhaiya. Atho to te tawaayo. But tawaayo pachi shu dhe wai. Yes. Like the sense that do I set the air limit or the or the or the skin limit to 37.5 for example or 37 or 36. Sisters are not trained to do that or they are not given limit or not the given freedom to do that on their own. Anyone yes, if they sir. do, they do it at a spinal level without even putting on the chart or informing the consultant that this baby had some temperature fluctuation. And then when the baby is really deteriorating and you go back and see the previous two, three days chart, you will realize that baby had definitely thermoregulation issues or the temperature instability. Yes, sir. So the small alarm can do so many things apart from damaging the baby's ears and all, and all, the, all you are discussed in the, in the article. So somehow the unit protocol or the culture should be such that alarm is to be not to be ignored, that is to be set, taken seriously. Each day, baby's alarm level need to be checked by the incha sister or someone who is taking charge of the baby's sister. This can happen to parents. And once you put the put the put the policy in the in the in it, they automatically start doing it. There is nothing great science or nothing great that the uh, art of establishing this kind of protocols. But if everyone start doing that, then only you can cut down that noise level because alarm level is irritating at times, you know, apart from the doctors discussing the things in front of the baby or sisters talking in, I mean, in, in between when, when the things are light or during the breaks or when the parents are there, somehow we forget the fact that a sick baby is lying in the bed and we are all discussing everything in front of them, making too much of the noise there. Isn't yes, it? Sir. Now, having yes, said that and looking to this article, how will you control noise pollution in your unit? Yes, From sir, tomorrow. As you told, sir, that the alarm should be set individually for all the infants. Uh, this will reduce the unnecessary beeping of the alarm. Also, when the alarm is uh, monitor has been beeping or night is alarm has. So the doctors need also to be educated on this topic. Okay, uh, what is the effects of elevated sound levels during the round? Also, once the round has been taken, the discussion should be out of the NICU unit. It shouldn't be inside the NICU unit or during the round. The round has to be taken, then the discussion should be done out of. No mobile phone should be allowed in NICU. All the mobile phones or all the electronic devices of the doctors or paramedical staff should be kept outside. So this will uh, uh, silence the unnecessary uh, ringing of the mobile phones. Now, uh, now this simple fact, the simple fact that alarm, the mobile is to be kept outside the NICU. How much is it possible? Yes, sir. To what level it is, to what extent is it going to be possible? Yes, it is, uh, Your voice is breaking. Yes, sir, it is. I too. Hello, sir. Yeah, now it's all right. Yes, sir, it is difficult. Obviously, it is very much difficult to put into practice all such measures. But the least we can do is if we start a little step, it will definitely do some effect. Or it will definitely uh, decrease some of the sound level in the NICU. We did a small QI study for 15 days. The Incha sister was given the red card. Okay. And the moment she she had, everyone can download this audio, the, this uh, sound level app, which is very much available on the any Android or the, you can download Android or iPhone. And the moment she finds that sound level of a consultant or any person, even alarms, is going up, she'll raise that red card. And the whole unit will get the message that something is wrong at the noise level. And believe me, after 15 days, things were totally settled. You know, everyone in the in the hospital or the NICU was feeling that we are in they are supposed to keep sound level down. But that lasted only for the next 15 days. Again, it went to because our human tendency is to, to speak at loud level. Concerned themselves started carrying the phone inside the ICU. So you need if the why this is ultimately it, it does good for the baby. So my my concern would be that if you can pit out four or five to five points from this article and take it to the NICU and do a QI study. Yes, sir. And Tom Segar, I'm sure will help you for that. 
I'm so, pretty sure it will become a good QI study that improving the quality of the sound in the in the NICU. So we can work on this also. So yes. I actually was, uh, before you started the point, I was going to say the next step. But because see, uh, was QI study. The reason I'm saying this is because uh, what factors they have evaluated are going to be different in our, in our, in our NICU. So you can actually spend what they, what that person did. She spent time in the NICU and she recorded sound levels. In fact, the monitor to record sound, as Ashish Bhai said, is there on phones. Uh, the actual monitor which can, can which is placed on the wall is also not very expensive. Uh, probably a few thousand rupees, three thousand, five thousand rupees. It's not not very expensive, and it shows color changes also. Uh, so you can either do that or they use the phone. Uh, make a list of uh, things that uh, are creating noise and try and get everyone together as a QI project, nurses, uh, doctors, residents, people who work, who clean the stuff. Many times people are cleaning the NIC or whatever they're doing, that often causes noise or people are getting uh, medication inside or shifting. Even, even washing the wash basin, cleaning the wash basin. In another room, huh? in another room, room, not in the NIC, little bit far away. Even yeah, if it is far away, that also, also, yeah. that also will cause noise. Cleaning. Autoclave cleaning, all these things make noise, you know. So all that yeah, makes noise. So, definitely. so you make a list of stuff what is making noise and try and see which can be minimized. So you work with everyone, kind of remove two things or three things, focus on few things, see how it works, and do that stepwise. And over a period of four five months, you'll realize that things are improved. And of course, uh, so initially when I asked the question, when such studies were done, such studies were done in 2007 and 2008 in St. John's. I was uh, part of the study of the implementation of the study and we showed that it reduced uh, reduced uh, we didn't have the android monitors at that point of time it was just uh, what do you say action taken for reducing like don't talk in front of the warmer do the discussions mm -hmm. outside uh, and so in general so that was uh, what was done but a lot of it involved training uh, nurses uh, and and staff uh, but now we have qi uh, which is like more, that time there was no qi that discussion you know, but now we have more QI, we have uh, phones which can detect uh, sound monitors. We can try and, try and use that. Uh, so the QI process is the best process to reduce noise uh, and to find out what makes noise. I think getting everyone together and saying that everyone will acknowledge mobile phone and so on and so forth. Make a list and see what can be reduced. Now, I wanted to discuss another point for any prevention related activity, not noise, anything, any for anything that you want to prevent. Uh, for preventive uh, actions, uh, for something to not happen, 70% of that prevention is actually depends upon uh, design or engineering. So if Ashish Bhai wants to build a new NICU, he'll build a new NICU with sound absorbent walls, sound absorbent floors, and so on and so forth. That will reduce much more noise uh, than having our regular floors. So that yes. is like taking out a lot of things out of the equation. Uh, having diff different kinds of walls. So if you look at the design of an NICU uh, article, it has very specific instructions on how to reduce sound in, sound, sound in NICU. So 70% of anything will actually result from the design of a particular process. 20% actually then comes from policies. Okay, so policy would be don't take mobile phone inside or so on and so forth. So basically administrative policies will reduce uh, your sound. And then 10% comes from individual person. Like I will not do this or I will not talk or whatever. So you can have policies, but 10% change. So uh, if whatever changes that we try and do through QI processes, we'll address around 20 to 30% of the problem. 70% of the problem will still remain that, that we cannot do much. But with whatever is available to us, we can at least try and prevent that 70, that 30, 40% of uh, reduction in, uh, in, in noise level. So that can be definitely done. And as Ashish Bhai said, after 15 days, it kind of drops. So you have to kind of carry out a longer process and uh, work. And in medical colleges, residents change, nurses change. So and then it becomes more and more necessary to do it on a, on a, on a regular basis. So that's, that, that was what my uh, point was. Yes, sir, definitely, sir. So if you want to do this study, how will you do? One is you should do a QI study. Uh, so yeah, any other way of any other way of looking at this? Uh, sir, uh, as you told there. So you could you you could look at uh, so one of the reasons why I'm asking is this uh, there are various issues in terms of uh, 
noise uh, you can look at neuro development so you can look at how babies behave so wait i was just talking about even currently you have a intervention which can reduce effect of noise on the baby what is that intervention even today there is an intervention available which can reduce the effect of that noise on the baby and since i am asking the question you should know the answer <laughs> so ashish will ask the answer is kangaroo mother care so once yes. you give kangaroo mother care once you give kangaroo mother care the sound that is that the baby hears and feels then everything is from the mothers and then it takes out the lot of environment out of the question now this particular article which is there it does not talk anything about kangaroo mother care so which is something which which is which is uh, which i find is is a problem because if you yeah, give this old baby, article रिलेटिवली the amount of uninterrupted sleep baby gets is less than a minute mm-hmm. okay because of noise and so many other things once the baby is put in kmc position baby goes off to sleep for 55 minutes 60 yes. minutes that is the reason why we do one hour of kmc now so that is an advantage and that kind of uh, uh, helps uh, provide uh, protection from many of the bad effects of uh, of noise so i think that's that that's uh, so any uh, Ashish, anything else that you wanted to discuss, or yeah, what are the long term implications of this? Which are the long term implications? Uh, sir, long term implications of this study includes the the neonates which are exposed to loud noises since the birth. If we take that neonates on a follow up, then there are chances there are some neuro developmental delay, or there are also chances that they get some auditory hearing. That's why we do OE in the patients which gets uh, admitted in the NICU. All the preterms which are admitted in NICU, we take uh, tell the babies to get OE done. My OE is done is for the for the neurotoxic is toxicity of the various thing like you know. some hyperviridinemia yes. or some drugs or some procedures ventilations the bad gases abnormal flow scoriomyelitis so many things can go wrong with the auditory system or i'll say autotoxicity or neuro neuro but what happens to those baby who are exposed to noise at at irrational levels there is a similarity if there is a correlation of poor long term cognitive outcome and a long term exposure to the noise that that's a problem and why that happens for that yeah hello hello yeah so abnormal cognitive functions in the long run that's issue if the babies are exposed to the noise for longer time so uh, i and there are a lot of animal studies uh, which they have done in rats and you know, what they have done they expose the rats on to lots of noise and some rats not exposed to noise and then they have dissected their brains and they show that the neuronal synapses that are formed in rats were exposed to noise all these animals were exposed to noise they all disorganized so yep. what ashish bhai is saying that long that is because the same thing would be happening in babies and so this uh, neuro development the synaptic connections happening in the brain uh, during neonatal period will be not so well organized and which would cause uh, developmental problems later on so cognition etc will will get affected yes and yes. hence it is important to do kmc okay sir so even uh, ear muffs the problem is even ear muffs also the discussion was about the ear muffs to tell the truth is difficult to get the right size of ear muffs yes, number sir. one number two i mean is easy to i mean now you normally it has been com- commonly it was been used for the basic tph and where you want to you do not want to disturb them at all just leave them alone and it the it does show that babies are babies are quiet the moment their ear earmuffs are on now on day to day basis using the near near earmuffs is not a easy practice also you know the cost in our setups number one number two different sizes are not available and number three at times the parents are different and different way of thinking about it and for they i mean it happened in our nursery at one time that grandma came and told us that we don't want to use ear muffs so nine is okay 
that is what the argument was and she was very strict ultimately third day i had to give i said i'm going to remove the earmuffs this was was one eight nine years back and we had a sample piece of earmuff we wanted to use that and this is what happened the grandma was scared because other showed her the photos and while seeing the photos grandma pick up ye kaan pe kya laga rakha so these are the indian issues of using earmuffs in the nursery we are at that level and we need to educate parents at this for that the earmuffs is for the betterment of the baby and not for causing any any, any problem to the baby yeah. so uh, one of the initial studies that were saying good effects of sound or the uh, music on the yeah. neuro development of the ch- child they were recommending actually the sound and uh, initially it was the same uh, music for each and everybody every neonates they came to the uh, studies that every child has a different sleep cycle so it's it should not be the same music for every hour at the same time for each and every baby then they started with this ear mops what uh, uh, ear plugs actually uh, for different child everyone but then what som shekhar sir said is that the child gets best sleep and even the best sound is of mother so the new intervention is the k and the mother who is uh, taking a, a sound or a music or a lori to the child. so if that is the thing you want to implement to your what is the amount like mother doesn't understand in what is the 45 decibel or what is the sound level so how will you advise the mother about the sound level in a term child during, during uh, giving care uh, ma'am uh, when we ask the mother or any of the relatives to come to the nice to give games to the baby uh usually uh in our nic uh, we are usually educating them that uh, all uh, apart from that baby there are also other babies which are in uh, severely critical ill uh, situations so we tell them to not to uh, if they are if they want to talk with their babies uh, uh, it is like uh, they need to whisper whispering of the sound the the sound should be such that that it shouldn't be uh, disturbing other neonates if the baby is in kms even if the mother would whisper the child will automatically will hear the mother's voice and the most uh, uh, what we can say effective kms would be if the child would have a peaceful sleep in the kangaroo mother care which also helps to uh, gain the weight in premature babies so uh, just a question and do you know uh, exactly have you uh, had access to a sound monitor and checked how much is 45 decibel have you checked it on the phone at any point of time okay so you should do it you should download it on a phone and check because 45 decibel is actually what we think is normal communication in a uh, in a in a busy area so if like you are standing in a classroom like in your like maybe mbbs classroom or phoenix classroom and you want to talk to somebody you have to talk a little louder that louder is goes above 50 decibel easily so the point what i'm trying to say so in a nic which is busy or there are lots of patients uh, any boy, any talking that you do even not across the room but even with somebody standing next to you that would easily cross 45 decibel it is Correct, said that is the whispering in the quiet library is 45 uh, decibel whispering yes. in the quiet library is 45 decibel so anything so basically normal talk what we do is going to be above your 50 decibel so it's basically even if really if you want to maintain below 45 then i all then you have to be basically not talking at all then only it will be for less than 40 so Nathan. in our 2 uh, to 3 patients like uh, uh, mother or father giving kmc so they uh, we had, means they only volunteer and they give kmc and they started like um gayatri mantra or one of the muslim patients their own mantras they keep baby and they on own uh, way of they uh, lip whispering or they started singing but not disturbing the other babies uh, so we used to do like this so uh, they sing in this, uh, in his own or in her own way yeah so no- noise is different from music so music uh, as oh, she uh, dr yeah. sachi pro- said it is useful now yes. uh, we we have published a study where it shows that noise also reduces 
pain during pin prick or even heel prick and also noise has uh, not noise music has got beneficial effects so it has to be music and not noise nice. so, so one of the sisters also suggesting that can we play music or uh, in utero sound similar to sounds available on youtube so many sounds are available similar to in utero sounds so uh, if we can play or we can put uh, besides the newborn is it recommended so many on youtube available so many sounds they are actually like they are represent that it is like in utero sounds but uh, can we play in an icu or is it recommended to come i have down? i have no idea and i will have to <laughs> find out so there was an article there was an article where a retired father in somewhere in america daily winning was allowed to get into the nicu and he will play simple violin for half an hour if you remember and during that half an hour the ball baby is vital swell like anything we we'll just play violin simple violin for half an hour and it was observed and this was published i don't remember the the the, the, the journal or the year but then definitely the sound has its effect music has its effect and obviously we are not looking at the jazz music we are looking at some soothing music so so so, so my answer was to that boom like you intra uterine sounds i have no idea of that but now the what you mentioned about violin now there are funny there are very funny i would say them funny because they are, they contradict each other so if you know in western western music there is this uh, mozart and there is beethoven and all there are so different kind of classical uh, I, I, they are not singers but they are composers there are articles which say that music by one composer is better for the babies and the music by the other composer is detrimental <laughs> to the babies so there are oh. some articles so i <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we don't. We will not use that. So I didn't bother to read much. But there are like, ये चलेगा लेकिन ये नहीं चलेगा. And both are like very well established composers. <laughs> okay, that's not 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 your noise. Like not like rock or Western classical music. So very interesting. Nice. <laughs> Doctor Nehal, just a word. Yes. I was listening to Doctor yes. Somashekhar sir and Doctor Mehta, and it's really wonderful to get all these tips from them. but they just wanted to share about uh, garbha sanskar it's a mm. old tradition uh, and uh, just to tell you how much uh, this virtual things are going on doctors are doing garbha sanskar on ladies who are pregnant in uk us and the, they do it in sessions one hour half an hour and all where all these things which are there in our old literature are all coming back actually the basic thing is just relaxation of the mother so that the baby is quiet grows well mother is also quite a lot of hormones which are good hormones for the baby are released in the mother and they look after the growth so we have some traditional things which and we are coming back to the same thing again in our nicus that keep it quiet so one of the ways is that, uh, when the baby passes from hdu to the low dependency to a feeder bay and on the way home that time uh, what we are doing is keep two hours uh, as sleep time so that nobody enters that room it the lights are switched off because they are in the feeder bay uh, they are not yet out of the nicu so such uh, timings based on your activities which comes with how we have bundle care in an icu so that way if you can have things together done and keep it as low as the noise can be and do it at intervals rather than each baby being handled and ultimately the whole 8 hours duty of a nurse is only noise and nothing else so it depends on your nicu how you space it out and reduce the noise levels so both sirs have given us good inputs with the literature which has been published and how we can do it and again i come back like the previous thing go for qi quality improvement small projects which are pdsa cycles which you run you take one point work on it for four weeks and see whether the noise reduces by 50% 10% 20% 
and the fishbone analysis in a QI project is, is excellent for this paper, where in your own NICU, you can try out this and each one benefits, people uh, feel good about it, then take the next problem, work on it like that. So it's doable, like nothing is not possible, like, but uh, leads to do some small, small QI projects. So, okay. uh, so I just wanted to share about Garbha Sanskar. Ma'am, I looked at, because one of my students wanted to do some research on Garbha Sanskar. I looked at the literature last week and there is hardly any published literature in the PubMed space, the uh, medical space. I am not talking about uh, Ayurvedic text. Now, so there, must, there is definitely a lot, uh, but there is hardly any uh, uh, literature which is published, uh, which means that there is more work that can be done in that area. Not that we should not do it, uh, but so this was something that uh, uh, we looked at. Uh, there are, uh, I think there is something called a Children's University in uh, Gandhinagar, uh, which uh, is been there for last 15 years or so. They have been doing Garbhat Sanskar classes for rural women in the field uh, since last almost 15 years or so. But they are not, they are just doing it in program mode. So there is no research uh, that is coming coming out of that. So which is another thing. Uh, you very rightly said because this is done most of the time by Ayurveda uh, qualified doctors. And right. we have a whole set of it. I have gone and seen how they conduct it. So basically, I at the end of it, I felt it is more of a psychotherapy. Like the way they talk, the way the, you, there is a music going on, they tell the mother to put it on that side also. And you know, like it's that way, but they are not doing, as you said, in the research mode. There have, I have suggested them you do a case control study of some mothers who have undergone Garbha Sanskar and its effect on the baby when they are born and you can do it on it. But then that basis is there with us. So maybe, sir, your student can do it if it is permitted by the ethics committee and the university. It will be a case control study. No, so I so you know, and in my college we are doing Garbha Sanskar classes, but again it's in program mode. But it's for like the obstetric people are doing it. Again, uh, not research. No, so no. that is how it is. So anyway, but the point uh, since we are a little bit deviating on the topic, uh, there are effects of intrauterine. Uh, what do you say? Mother, mother being stressed, mother being uh, what do you say? Uh, having perinatal depression has definite effects on. Uh, on on their babies and this is proven by research garbha sanskar doing good things whether it improves that has not been proven but uh, calamities natural calamities uh, depression uh, causing issues in the in the in the newborn baby has there are uh, quite a few studies uh, that 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 show that means i have a presentation on it but i don't think we have time i was thinking of showing but then we don't have time so uh, we are completing exactly at 8 and I thank you so much to all the three experts, Ashish Mehta sir, Som Shekhar sir and Preeti Galgali ma'am. Uh, in the discussion, uh, you were some like uh, so many insights and uh, so many things uh, discussed and some inputs coming from Aarti Kinkar ma'am at the in between the discussion, they were also uh, awesome. I must congratulate both the presenters, Dr. Urmi and Dr. Kamlesh. They have uh, presented, selected actually a very nice topic to discuss and presented it very nicely and guided by Dr. Sachi. So, Sachi, uh, you also deserve a cap. <laughs> and, uh, thank you so much for giving us this uh, uh, platform. So, thank you, ma'am, for this opportunity. Thank you. So thank much. you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your valuable insights. We are more than grateful to have you over here and hoping to meet you again on this platform very soon for your next session. And with all your permission, I'm concluding the session over here, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Uh, next you. session is on TP. Yes. So okay. please, I can to part. Yes. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank